Statistics, standard error. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get futuristic, we need statistics. One of the key components of statistics being statistical inference, which we typically use every time we want to find information about a large population, but we can't test every item within that large population. Therefore, the strategy, take a sample of that population, test the sample, hoping we can apply the characteristics found from the sample to the larger population, remembering that we can never have complete certainty when doing an inference such as this, because we're going from a smaller subset to a larger set, but we're trying to get as confident as we can and possibly be able to measure the level of confidence that we may be able to have by analyzing statistical inference and how it works. So some of the key components are the central limit theorem, which we discussed in a prior section, which helps us to understand and utilize the concepts of the bell-shaped curve. We would like to use the bell-shaped curve if applicable because there are characteristics of the bell-shaped curve that are useful and helpful for our analysis and because we can describe the bell-shaped curve very easily with just two numbers, one being the mean or average, the middle point of the curve, and the second being the spread or standard deviation of the curve. So the central limit theorem helps us to have data that might be uh, not bell-shaped in character still be able to utilize the bell-shaped curve by... First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Instead of plotting just the data itself, we think about the concept of taking multiple samples or the concepts of taking all possible combinations of samples of whatever sample size that we pick the average or mean of each of those samples. And then if we take basically the mean of all those numbers, the mean of the mean of all the samples, that's the data that will tend towards a bell-shaped curve. So there's two numbers that we need in order to plot that bell-shaped curve, one being the average or the mean, which is still pretty easy to think about because whether we think about the population itself we don't know the standard deviation or the mean, but we will approximate it with the sample. So the sample mean will approximate the population mean, the mean of the mean of all uh, combinations of samples that we take will also approximate the uh, actual population mean. It's the standard deviation that becomes confusing because we have the standard deviation of the entire population, we have the standard deviation of the sample, which will approximate, hopefully, the standard deviation of the population. But then what we really want is the standard deviation of all possible combinations of samples, the mean of all possible combinations of samples, which we will derive with a formula, a formula that has been put together by observations taken by looking at actual populations and then running the test of all possible combinations of means which we think we have down good enough to use as a formula to apply to situations where we don't know the entire population. That's the general concept. So in statistics, when we want to make inferences about a population, having a sample that we want to apply to the entire population, we usually rely on samples. However, a key question arises. How much does our sample statistic, like the sample mean, differ from the true population parameter, like the population mean? So in other words, obviously, if we're looking for the mean data, like the average height of people, we have the population mean, which we do not know, and then we have the mean that we got from our sample. What's going to be the difference between the mean that we got and the population mean is going to be, of course, one of the questions we would wish 
and like to have or possibly have some assurity or some concept of how off we might be given our statistical inference. So this is where the standard error, the SE, comes into play. Uh, it quantifies the uncertainty associated with the sample statistic. So we're trying to find what the middle point is, like the average height of people. And then we're also trying to think about, we know this isn't perfect, how close are we to it? Definition of the standard error. Standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of a statistic. So once again, standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of a statistic. So in, term, uh, in simpler terms, it tells us how much variability we can expect in our sample statistic from uh, sample to sample. So again, we're looking at the sample statistic from sample to sample. So if we were measuring the height of people in a particular population, the height of the people might be a bell-shaped curve situation, but it might not be. It might be binomial, binomial, especially if you're measuring both men and women and you're still looking for the average of uh, the entire population. But what we're looking at is to say we're imagining we take multiple uh, samples, or you can imagine the limit of that taking all combinations of samples of whatever sample size we pick, say 30 people at a time for each uh, of the samples. So now we're looking at the data, which is consisting of the average height of all of the samples of sample size 30. And that's the data that we're measuring the standard, uh, the standard error of, which is equivalent to, in essence, the standard deviation of that data, which will tend towards a bell-shaped curve, even if the population uh, does not, the actual population data does not. So mathematically, the standard error of uh, the mean, SE, where, so sigma is typically what we use uh, for the population standard deviation. So we have the population itself, like the population of the people that we're measuring the heights for. We have the standard deviation of that population, even if that data is not normally distributed, we can still get a standard deviation which measures the spread of the data. It's just that we cannot really make a bell-shaped curve based on that information because it's not a bell-shaped set of data, but we can still get an idea of the measure of spread using a standard deviation calculation. Small n generally represents the sample size. So if we take a sample size, say, of 30, so now that's how big the sample is going to be. We might only take one sample, but we could take multiple samples of n sample size 30. Even if we only take one sample, however, we would like to conceptually think about the idea of taking all possible combinations of sample size of whatever sample size we choose, 30, and then taking the mean of all of those samples, all combinations of samples, that being the data set that we're actually plotting the belt shape curve upon. S is the standard deviation of the sample. So note there's a standard deviation of the population, like the heights, the actual standard deviation or spread of all the heights of the population, and then there's standard deviation of the sample, like a sample of 30, what's gonna be the standard deviation there? Noting the standard deviation of the population, if known, which sometimes it is, we might, we might be doing a hypothesis test where we know the standard deviation of the population and we're trying to double check the middle point for a hypothesis test or something like that. If the standard deviation of the population is known, we can use that in our formula to calculate the standard error. But if the standard deviation is not known, then we can default to the standard deviation of uh, the sample, which should approximate the standard deviation of the population, but still isn't bell-shaped curved necessarily, or is not related to data, which has a bell-shaped curve. And therefore, we might use it in the formula to calculate the standard error, which is the standard deviation that we imagine of all possible combinations of whatever sample size we chose, the mean of all possible combinations. So we have the standard deviation of uh, X bar, which is what we often will use for the standard error calculation, which is sigma X bar. And then we have sigma, which represents the standard deviation of the population. So if that is known, that's what we'll use in our formula divided by the square root of N, 
n is the sample size. So that's going to be our formula. And you might, we have some example problems in another course or section that helps to get an idea of how they came up with this formula. But obviously they came up with the formula by running tests and looking at the relationship or deriving the relationship between a population like that's actually known and then, and then uh, the standard deviation of all possible combinations of samples. Based on that information, we can approximate that with a formula. Therefore, even if we only took one sample, we're still going to run the formula and create the bell curve as though we're taking all possible combinations, the mean of all possible combinations of samples of whatever sample size, approximating the standard deviation with this formula. And the mean, we can still use the sample mean because the sample mean will approximate the mean of the population. So if we don't know what this sigma is, standard deviation of the population, we can use the standard deviation of the sample, which isn't perfect, but will approximate the standard deviation of the population. If we're forced to use the standard deviation of the sample, we might then deviate from going from a normal distribution to what's known as T distributions, which is the same concept, but the tails are fatter in T distributions, which we might talk about more in future presentations. All right, so the standard error helps us estimate the pr precision of the sample mean as an estimate of uh, the population mean. So that's, of course, kind of what we're looking for. We're trying to say this is what we got for the population mean, and we're trying to give, give some kind of precision about that data. How accurate is it? How sure are we about the number that we got, the average height of the people, how confident are we in that? Construct confident intervals, which give us a range of plausible uh, values for a population parameter. So when we do confidence intervals, we might say, okay, look, this is the mean that I got from the population. I'm gonna give some interval around that mean and hopefully be able to give some type of confidence that the actual number is is within that confidence interval to some degree of accuracy. Uh, perform hypothesis tests to determine if a sample mean is significantly different from a hypothesized population mean. Now, these are the two ways that we typically construct a statistical inference kind of situation. Noting that the construct, the, 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 when we have a confidence interval situation, that might be where we don't really know what the middle point is. So if maybe I have no idea what the average height of the population is, and therefore I'm not going to approximate it maybe with a hypothesis test, but rather take the sample first and then build my confidence interval around the mean or average I got from the sample, which is going to be done in part with the standard error is going to help us with that calculation. Or we might have an idea what we think the standard the population mean is. Maybe we know the population mean height of the country, and now we want to see if our particular region is having the same mean height, for example. Therefore, we're going to build our hypothesis in a similar way as you might see in a United States court case, where we say we assume that to be the case unless there's evidence enough sufficient to disprove it. So we'll build the actual graph around the hypothesized middle point, the bell curve, and then we'll see if the data that we get from the sample is far enough away from that hypothesized value uh, to give us, to give us uh, enough evidence to reject the hypothesis, once again, building the bell curve based on the standard error calculation. That gives us the spread of the bell curve. So the smaller the standard error, the closer the sample mean is expected to be to the population mean. So a smaller standard error is going to give us a closer you know, range. So it's critical to differentiate between standard error and standard deviation. So standard deviation, SD, measures the spread of data points in a single sample or population. So remember, they're, they're similar in that the standard the standard error is the standard deviation of the data that we're going to construct the bell-shaped curve from, but it's not the standard deviation of the actual data points, right? When we think about the standard deviation of the population, we're looking at the spread of the data 
of the actual population data, which might not be bell-shaped at all. It might be skewed to the left, skewed to the right, normally distributed. The standard error, SE, measures the spread of the sample mean around the population mean, i.e. The, uh, the precision of the estimate. So now the standard error, we're typically, again, kind of conceptualizing the idea that we're taking the average uh, of all possible combinations of samples and looking at the, the standard deviation of that data, which we're now calling the standard error, that's the thing that we're going to construct our bell shape uh, curve from because it's going to tend towards a bell shape due to the central limit theorem. So once again, measures the spread of the sample mean, meaning the means of the samples, right, around the population mean, remembering that that middle point is the same. So the middle point, the average, the middle point will be the same for the population and approximated to that middle point by the sample. And it would be also approximated if we took all possible combinations, the mean of all co possible combinations and took the mean of that, again, that would all tend towards the same middle point. It's the standard deviation, the spread that we have this situation for that we have to use a formula typically to go from the standard deviation of the population, which might not be bell shaped to the standard deviation of like all possible combinations, the mean of all possible combinations of samples. So for example, if you're taking multiple samples and calculating the mean for uh, each sample, SE, the standard error, tells you how much the sample means are expected to vary. So, so if we're taking, if we took multiple different samples, then the standard error is supposed to be the spread not of the actual data, but of the of the average of each of the samples that we're that we're taking, which we could build by taking multiple samples, every possible sample. But that's not what we actually do. We calculate the standard error based on the relationship derived and given to us in a formula. So the key to reducing standard error lies in increasing the sample size in the larger the sample size the smaller the de denominator in the formula. So you'll recall that the formula is the, is the standard deviation of the population or the sample, if we don't know the population, divided by the square root of n. n is the sample size. So if you increase n, you're gonna increase the denominator, reducing uh, the standard error calculation. So the smaller their overall standard error, this means that by increasing the sample size, we obtain a more precise estimate of the population parameter. So a confidence interval gives us the range of values in which we expect the true population parameter to lie based on our sample data. So we'll run many examples in another course or section on uh, that will use the two methods that we apply that will both use calculations of standard error for inferences that be hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. Confidence intervals lending itself to situations where we don't think we know what the middle point is. We take the sample, you can imagine taking the data first, making the middle point the mean from the data, average height in our example, and then constructing an interval around it, which will be dependent in part on the standard error calculation. So the formula for the confident interval for a sample mean is confident intervals, the sample mean, the mean we got from the sample, the sample, the average height, plus and minus, meaning we're gonna put on each side of that middle point, you're imagining a bell-shaped curve, where you have the middle point, and then we've got each side of the middle point is gonna be the standard error. Uh, so, so the critical, so plus or minus the critical value times the standard error. So that's going to give us our ranges around it, which we'll talk more about in examples. So a smaller standard error results in a narrower confidence interval, giving us a more precise estimate. So clearly, if you look at this formula, you're going to, you're going to get a smaller standard error would be giving you a narrower range. So let's say you want to estimate the average height of students in your university, but it's impractical to measure everyone. So uh, you, you take a sample of 100 students and calculate the mean height as 170 centimeters with a, samp with a sample standard deviation of 10 centimeters. So, so we're, we're measuring the heights of the students 
We have the whole population of the university, which isn't given here, but we're going to imagine it's fairly large. We take the 100 students as the sample that's greater than, that's far above like 30, which is often the default number that people cite as a number to make sure the central limit theorem kicks in, even if the average heights of the students are not tending towards a bell-shaped curve, and the mean height is 170. The average height that we got from the sample, 170, with a, with a sample standard deviation of 10 centimeters. Notice that's the standard deviation of the sample. Uh, it's, not, it's not the standard deviation or, or the standard error calculation. So to compute the standard error, we're going to take the 10, uh, the 10 divided by the square root of 100. So we took the standard deviation here, the standard deviation of the sample, divided by the square root of uh, 100, which is n, n is 100, gives us 1. So this means that the sample mean is expected to vary by about one centimeter from the true population mean due to the random sampling variability. So notice we're talking about if we took multiple samples and then took the average of each of the samples, that's what the standard error is calculating, not the spread of the data between each of the data points, each of the individual students, not the spread of the actual population this, the standard deviation of the population would be approximated by the standard deviation of the sample, which would be the 10 centimeters, right? Okay, summary. Standard error SE provides a measure of how much the sample mean is expected to vary from the population mean. Uh, it is smaller when the sample size is larger, giving us a more precise estimate. So we have this concept of, again, the larger sample sizes uh, being better. However, again, we do have diminishing returns once we get past uh, a particular point uh, of them. So the standard error is essential for constructing confidence intervals and performing hypothesis testing. Confidence intervals and hypothesis testing being the two main formats that we used to do statistical inferences where we want to find information about a large population by taking a sample of the population, testing it, applying the findings found to the larger population. Key takeaways, the larger the sample size, the smaller the SE, which is going to be the standard error. And so that's typically a good thing. But again, there are limitations. It's not like a one-to-one -one, as we saw before, meaning you're going to get the idea that how do I make a better test? I take larger and larger samples of data, which is somewhat uh, misleading. So there's going to be diminishing returns as we get to the larger data, remembering the idea being that we need a large enough amount of data to make sure that we're tending towards the central limit theorem. And then when we have a larger amount of data, it's also going to impact. Now we're seeing the standard error calculation uh, as well. And so then we have uh, a smaller standard error means more precise uh, estimates. So standard error is crucial for understanding the accuracy of sample statistics and estimating population parameters.